Victor Kai's Clash of Demon Head for the NES, released in 1989, or 1990 if you prefer. Oh, and here's a quick trivia. This was actually released in Japan under the title of Dengeki Big Bang, hence this game's main protagonist. Take note, although I'm gonna mention it later on in this review, this is total shit all, if only little, to do with the Scott Pilgrim Band whatsoever. The story's set in 1990X, and a badass yet unlikely agent, Sergeant Billy Blitz, otherwise known as Bang, or Big Bang if you will, in service of an organization known as Saber, short for the Special Assault Brigade for Real Emergencies, is on vacation relaxing with his better half and partner Mary. When suddenly, a transmission from HQ is forwarded to him. What does it entail, one might ask? Bang is eventually tasked with rescuing Professor Plum, the aptly described inventor of the Doomsday Bomb, a deadly explosive capable of bringing the world as we dearly know it to a chaotic as fuck end from being abducted by a mysterious organization of adversaries, which I'll discuss momentarily. Shifting gears to the rudimentary gameplay aspect, it's way more, and I do mean way more, than just your run-of-the-mill point A to point B action platforming romp. As you're storming through each route erected throughout the titular Demon Head Mountain, not only are you wasting the bejesus out of every goddamn adversary in sight, or farming and grinding your ass off for extra moolah, cash if you will, life refills in the form of hearts, and even fruit and gold pieces, the penultimate of which is good for your force points, which I'll yet again discuss momentarily, you're in hot pursuit of the so-called Royal Medallions of the Seven Governors, as informed by your first ever target of said cartel, Tom Guycott, whom we will be running into later. Aside from Bang's basic movements and actions, you know, the usual B and A for attacking and jumping respectively, duck walking and crawling via down left and down right diagonally on the D-pad, climbing walls via up and down, the louder where you're able to descend faster, you can actually refer to your map by pausing at any time, or upon reaching the end of any given route, where you can pick where to travel next. There's even an inventory menu which can be accessed by pushing select, containing your secondary weapons, particularly the barrier, the thundershot, the powerball, and the rolling star. Aiding items, namely Dyna Punch for your Force Points, and Ultra Food for your Life Points, aside from the Hearts, and of course your accessories, Super Suit, Power Boots, Jetpack, and Aqualung, not to be confused with the Jethro Tull Song, all of which safeguards Bank from lava and other grave liabilities, enhances Bank's overall agility and height, makes Bank fly in mid-air via the aforestated A button, and is great for traversing over huge gaps, and provides him with better underwater capabilities, respectively. On well, speaking of which, every time Bang dives into the water, he always loses a pint or two of life, so I suggest traversing through the water with his head popping out of the surface. Now getting back, those items can be purchased at any time at the Super Shop, accessed by using its calling card from said menu. And speaking of the Super Shop, whenever you're done buying your extra items, I wouldn't even so much as think of taking off without buying an extra calling card, cause otherwise, I'd consider myself fucked if I were you, in which case my only last resort is Route 5. Route fucking 5. Topping off the inventory lineup is the Micro Recorder, used for transmitting your passwords depending on the magnitude of your progress. Upon using this very device, be sure to jot down the currently displayed password before returning to the action, or, as ever, look them up online. Hell, there's even a slew of five special powers, or in this game's case, forces, that you can acquire upon not only defeating Rowdy, one of Gaikot's lackeys no less, but rescuing the Hermit in the process. Of course, in order to pursue that ruthless son of a bitch, you have to connect with other allies and absorb as much info as possible from them, namely a lone, pudgy, and diminutive miner known as Michael on Route 3, and later a fairy known as Facia on Route 17 following a myriad of pits. Same story with backtracking and venturing in between each and every route and connecting warp to reach every fucking integral objective. And since we're on that goddamn subject, you know how most games, if just a few, prohibit backtracking? Well, that ain't the case in Clash of Demon Head, oh fuck no. Well, mostly due to a hell of a lot more than just the length provided in every route. Oh, and in True Legend of Zelda, Kid Icarus, Star Tropics, and Metroid fashion, this shoot will consume each and every second of your precious time in a way you've never imagined possible. Be sure to bear in mind the following tips and stipulations. Whenever you use a weapon and or accessory, there's either an ammo count, in the former case, or a time limit bar of usage concerning the latter that takes effect upon activation. In both cases, however, I strongly recommend using them as sparingly as possible, or disabling them early on. Learn all five of the Hermit's forces, as mentioned previously, as early on as possible. And whenever you die, you're stuck with fuck all but a continue feature following a game over, in which case you have to start back at the beginning of the route within which your ass got wasted. Same story with the hazards which I'm about to discuss soon, and also the reason why I suggest referring back to the password hint I recounted. Same story with what I'm about to discuss in the next subject. 
No matter how often you play, there's always something new on the table thanks to the gameplay procedure's tendency to keep itself from becoming too monotonous, and its control mechanics aren't too detestable to accustom oneself with, despite the little gripes that it harbors. As far as this game's challenge is concerned, other than what I've broken down so far, the fact that you can't progress any further without having a specific non-playable character ally informing you about a certain detail can be a huge pain in the taint. But if you're like the happy video game nerd, that's right, Derek, I'm looking at you, and are definitely up to the initiative of taking notes throughout every chapter, more power to ya! Nevertheless, death will always be waiting you at every turn no matter how far you traverse, thus causing you nothing more than a lifetime supply of shit flipperitis, code for endless rage and anger, that is. And it ain't just the hazards, oh shit, no. Every governor boss that you face within a certain root area will hand both your ass and balls to you in a fucking osterizer, and even sweep the floor with your own kidneys in less than half a goddamn second flat if you're not fully equipped and on your guard. Oh, and going back to the pits, aside from the instant death lava, others include a random cave at the very bottom, where you have to start from the beginning of the route after escaping, and upon reaching the final area, namely that atop the summit of Demon Head Mountain, no less. The Order of the Medallions, if by this point you've gathered them all, in which to place them on the Doomsday Bomb after you've obliterated the last two dickheads, one of which is the Big Boss Applesauce Head Hajo of Governors, is fucking randomized, in which case I strongly recommend exhausting every visual and experimental possibility, cause the ending depends on your efforts. Should you waste all five attempts, you, not to mention all of humanity, and god forbid, even your chances of saving it, are totally fucked beyond all expectations. While the graphics are nothing much to write home about, the visuals are definitely far from average. Boasting influences from 80s manga and anime pioneers, hell, if before said decade, for example, Toriyama of Dragon Ball fame, Otomo of Akira fame, the late Suzuka of Astro Boy fame, Takahashi of Inuyasha, Rama 1 Half, and Urusei Yatsura fame, Tatsunoko Zon Yoshida Brothers, Kenji Ipe Kuri, especially the late Tatsuo, God rest his soul, Miyazaki, and the like. The overall presentation will make you feel almost as if you're watching a Saturday morning cartoon show. In fact, speaking of which, this puts even the likes of Deke, Hanna-Barbera, Fred Wolf Films, formerly Morikami Wolf Swenson, and even the likes of Disney, DreamWorks, and Pixar to total shame. Old Big Bang himself was rather amusing, whether it's in-game, during the opening cutscene, or even the talking time scenes, the latter of which are this game's main highlights, especially the assorted facial expressions he displays. Same situation with the supporting characters and the bosses he confronts. The majority of the in-game dialogue is nothing short of modest and gratifying, while awkward at times, and most of the background and foreground elements are vivid and tasteful, and above all, are absolutely NOT something to be mocked at here, no fucking way, and neither are the in-game rendition appearances of the governor bosses that you face. As much as I detest providing blatant second-rate understatements, the run-of-the-mill enemies, however, just scream all kinds of meh, or better yet, blah, or in this case, a meh blah. On another honorable mention I'd like to give props to, in terms of game highlights, are the supporting characters blurting no every time you fire away at them. Composed and arranged by Michihara Hasuya of Tecmo's Raigar, Solomon's Key, and Mighty Bob Jack fame, not to mention the infamous Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Toho and Bandai, in association with Advanced Communications Company, Gogol 13 Top Secret Episode, and Kid Cool in the Quest for the Seven Wonder Herbs, both of which Victor Kai released not long before. Keith Courage and Alpha Zones for the TurboGrafx-16, and even Super Godzilla. Hell, he was even a sound driver for both Circus Caper by Toho and Dino Wars by Bandai. Despite my first impulse to look the other way regarding the game's scores, they're short, and I do mean short, of abrasive. Sure, a few melodies tend to repeat themselves in between various instances, but they're actually gleeful to get used to. The sound effects, however, could have used more tweaks left and right, but are definitely far from ho-hum and tiresome, no rhyme intended. Oh, and take note of my usual top 5 favorites from this game. Ultimately, concerning Clash of Demon Head's replayability, well, hey, look who's talking here, and it sure as hell ain't whistling Dixie, oh shit, no. Thanks as a whole to the numerous myriad of paths you take, the differentiating plot twists that occur within said paths, and even the numerous array of weapons, accessories, and strategies that you're capable of utilizing and experimenting with, you'll be desiring nothing more, or nothing else, god forbid, than to return constantly to the semi-forgotten choice like your dear life depended on it, for sure. Henceforth, in dauntless summation, my final verdict on Clash of Demon Head, notwithstanding the fact that this game's initial sales weren't at their absolute best during the time of its release, in comparison to other NES games from that very same time period, it's been gaining something of a cult following, not as big as something as, say, Nintendo and Shige Sato E-Toys Earthbound, but definitely up there. If you're in the mood for yet another in the slew of bar none, lengthy beyond belief, strenuous journeys of all time, I wholeheartedly recommend getting my lazy ass out there and tracking this hidden gem down ASAP. Until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God officially signing off.